Dr. Kande Yumkela, Under Secretary General, SC4 CEO, PhD. Well, I, I will not do this. I will just put it. I have here full uh, full list of his credentials, and I think it's no paper can describe Kande Yumkela. Kande Yumkela is a um, unique man. He's a human. He stole heart of many scientists around the world. He stole heart of many politicians around the world. He's somebody who came from uh, the very beginnings, back to Sierra Leone, and he reached the top of the global discussion about sustainable futures. Kande, it is our privilege to have had you over the last six, seven, eight years as a great collaborator and friend of Yasa. It is a great privilege to have you here today with us to give this special lecture. Welcome again, Mrs. Yamkela, welcome as too. The floor is yours. Distinguished participants, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Pavel and Yasa, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share a few ideas with this learned community. And uh, I have had this habit now eight years. I go to places to do speeches in China, in New York, and other places. And I used to take Naki Sanovich with me eight years ago. And we go there, and I say, my job is to open, and I do my five minutes. I say, Nasi, Na Naki can give you the facts. And today, I just, I didn't come with any slides today, but I see that Vaughn has a slide that I like, the one with the two circles, if you can put it up. That's what I want to talk to you about, that interface, what we try to do, what we try to do now on the energy front. Um, I was asked to be chair of UN Energy, uh, which was created at the Rio Plus 10 summit in uh, South Africa. Secretary General asked me to chair it because some of my colleagues told him that this guy in many of our meetings, he always talks about energy and he's not an energy expert. But since he likes it, why don't you ask him to chair this group? 20 something UN agencies plus the World Bank. And of course I went to the first three meetings and I got bored. And I'm sure Minister Ramesh can, can relate to that. You know, we were praising ourselves around the table. We're doing very well in the world. And at the very early stage of that, I had Luis Gomez Echiveri, another Yaza uh, colleague, and I had never met him. We went to Bali, Climate Summit, and they said, don't worry, Mr. Yumkela, this is your first meeting of UN Energy. The real work will be done by this guy who just retired from UNFCCC called Luis. So after getting bored, I was sitting with Luis. I said, Luis, is this what this group is about? I want to talk about energy poverty. The reality of energy poverty and what happens to my people when they don't have energy. And here I have these guys praising themselves that they're doing very well, but nothing changes. Fast forward. I, I was not an energy expert, but I was convinced based on experience in Sierra Leone, in Nigeria, as a minister, as an academic, as a student, that without energy you can't have development. We can't, without energy you can't have wealth creation. The hospitals will not run. So I was sitting with these colleagues every day in these meetings, telling me how wonderful we were all doing. I said, but yet people do not have access to energy. So our ambition level grew. After one year, uh, Akim Steiner, head of UNEP, and myself, we put a team of five people together. We requested to see the Secretary General, the new Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And our message to him was, look, we see you're committed to climate change. But your story is not complete. You're talking about climate change, but you never mention energy. And so, of course, we had choreographed, Yumkela, you have three minutes introduction, Akim has five, and we went down, and then we left the World Bank man last to give the data on energy poverty. So we finished, and the Secretary General said, well, Mr. Yumkela, thank you very much. Let me tell you a story about myself in South Korea after the war how we lived without energy, fetching water, and using candles and lamps to study. He says, so I thought you were going to tell me to set up a multi-stakeholder group. Of course, that's what I wanted. But the bureaucrats had told me he'll never do it. The new Secretary General does not like high-level panels. So we ended up creating the first high-level panel, which I, he asked me to chair. Well, okay, so we got what we wanted. So what are they going to discuss? What is the substance? 
uh, what Vaughn was saying. What is the substance? I'm very grateful that I had Yasa. Uh, we worked on this Nakisanovich, uh, Detloff and others in those early days. They realized immediately that Kande's knowledge of energy is 2%. So if he's going to advocate properly, we better educate him well. So they did the next best thing, put me on a cancel on the global energy assessment with all these superstars. I fast forward a little bit. What did we achieve? It's eight years of hard work. For 20 years, the UN will not discuss energy in a civilized way. The moment you mention energy at the UN, it's a discussion breaker. The big boys fight over oil and gas. Who has more access to those? So it's the geopolitics of, of energy that took over. How do we create a narrative? How do we provide evidence that in fact energy was the missing millennium development goal? So my first message to you is thanks to science. Thanks to Yasa. Because Yasa then had the analysis. They linked me up with others, Potsdam Institute, IEA and others, who knew the numbers, who knew the facts. Because when you advocate, anecdotes have a limit. You can use anecdotes. We all like the stories. But of course, when you come to some policymakers in very rich countries, behind them, maybe they have 10 experts that can challenge every example you give. Of course, I learned that in my first pol policy class at Cornell. That analysis is good, but you better understand the policy process if you want to influence. If you want to influence domestic policy or you want to influence diplomacy. And of course, that led, meant long story, we had this report. I arranged for Naki and others to visit the Secretary General in New York. We arranged a lot of presentations in New York, bringing experts from India, Brazil, developing countries, because I had a problem in diplomacy. One group was talking green energy. Of course, I made the sacrilege of one saying, my mother does not care about the color of energy. She has none. So, of course, people felt that was arrogant. But it is fact. She has, she's living in darkness in my village. Does she care whether it's green or red? But, of course, you have to understand the interest groups about climate change. So, of course, thanks to science, they introduced me to that. The bottom line is we were able to develop a narrative of sustainable energy for all based on scientific evidence, based on numbers. And given the complexity of energy, we said we reduce it to two issues only. Of the 50 issues we want to cover, let's focus on access, let's focus on efficiency. That was the first report we did for the Secretary General. Of course, so I've talked about getting the information, the knowledge, being plugged to the community. You had a network of 500 energy experts from around the world working on this document. One day I asked Naki, I said, Naki, do you have one source that I can take on the plane when I'm traveling to read more about energy? He says, there's no one source, but we're working on something. I never knew that they were going to publish a 2,500 page document. This one here at the bottom. So I had to rely on knowledge systems and I used my knowledge of politics, politics and diplomacy, to get the scientific, scientific facts into the room and define clear objectives of what we wanted and the narrative. What I have learned about diplomacy and politics, the narrative. You can throw facts at people, numbers. It will not change the needle. It will not move it. You have to have the right narrative for a politician or a diplomat to make, in other words, what makes them tick. But that message, that narrative has to be backed by real facts because they will drill down later on. We were able to do that and we established sustainable energy for all. We now have an SDG 7, sustainable development goal number 7. The world could not do that for the past 20 years. How were we able to build a consensus? between the BRICS and the very rich countries, small island states, the Africans to agree and going into Rio, plus 20. I just wanted to make the first case that thanks to YASA, thanks to science, thanks to analysis, we could do our advocacy with confidence. And I give you two anecdotes of what happened in the middle when we thought we were doing well. Just before Rio, I got a call from the Secretary General's office, Bob Orr. Mr. Yumkela, we just finished a meeting with the Secretary General with a delegation for the Rio Plus 20 Summit. 
they say this idea of sustainable energy for all is going to increase emissions. I say, are you kidding? They say, well, they say if that's the case, they will block it in Rio. Of course, I ran quickly, picked up the phone. Say, Naki, can you crunch the numbers again? They say when we give energy to poor people, climate change gets worse. They crunched the numbers. I called IEA. Others crunched the numbers, and we came out with evidence. And you will see it in the IEA outlook at 2010-2011. We showed the numbers that that's not true. That's not true. I just wanted to make the first case that in putting energy on the global agenda, we had to rely on science, and I'm very grateful I had to educate myself, but I had to make sure that I had for eight years, because all along the way we had challenges. Whether you choose a technology, you choose a public policy, feed-in tariff. Where does it work? Why did it work? Analysis. That's the, the knowledge systems. So all along the way we had to rely on science. And today here are the things we've achieved. We have an SDG. We created two forums in eight years. The Vienna Energy Forum. And now I just finished the, the other one, the second inning. The Sustainable Energy for All Forum in New York. Why? I have learned in these eight years that you need to create a social movement. You need those young people at the back. So we created a platform of 2,000 NGOs plugged into the energy system. 80% of them are not energy NGOs. They're NGOs working in food, health, women's issues, and children's issues. But they've always recognized that energy was central to their solutions. And now I see my friend Bjorn in front here. In that march, of course, I realized very quickly the analysis is great. I can harass Ramesh and the other ministers to change public policy, but who has the cash and technology? That's when I bumped into another guy called Bjorn. Um, I remember some of the meetings once organized by the Italians in uh, Trieste. We met there. We've been in many forums together. How do you get another narrative to get the private sector into that room? And so Sustainable Energy for All, we're very proud today. We have over 50 companies, some very big labels. But Bjorn, thank you very much. I had to learn something else. How do you take all of that data beyond the diplomacy, put another circle here, private sector? Which brings me to the SDG, the post-2015 development agenda. We've defined a good agenda, 17 goals, over 160 targets. By the time we add indicators, it will be 500. And Pavel keeps telling me, of course, Pavel joined later. I know Pavel is a waterman. Say, Kandi, I like your energy story. But you guys cause havoc for us in the water space. So we started our journey together. So Pavel taught me this language of nexus. Well, my dear friend, 17 goals, 160 something targets, maybe 500 indicators. And you want us to think in N dimension. I give you the reality. When we were lobbying intensely last year, what should be the targets we present to member states so that they can agree on SDG 7? I played a trick. I said, put the three we want the most on top. Let's add another four. And the other four were the nexus target. Energy and water, energy and food, energy and women, energy and, and um, the last one, I've, I think ecosystems or something. I said, and give them numbers. When they went into the room, because I thought I was innovating, you know, coming with Nexus, the first guy to present Nexus targets, the diplomat said, okay, we like what they've done, these energy people, but throw the other four out. <laughs> it's too complicated. Well, just think about it a minute for those who will be implementing those goals. You and I and the scientific community know they are connected. One of the problems with the Millennium Development Goals was we all behaved in silos. If you want transformative change, not band-aid, you got to look holistically and look at that nexus, those connections, particularly for energy. Energy touches everything, including, of course, the biggest risk multiplier, climate change. How do you get people in, to think in those end dimensions? How do you monitor and track the results if you don't have good analysis and a key role for science? And of course, the Secretary General has set up a team with Jeffrey Sachs, Pavel, and others to begin to look at that. How do you measure? How do you track over time? And how do you make that nexus case also for public policy? 
I end up with uh, three last points as you look ahead. What you, the scientific community, have to know, I borrowed this from an American politician, is the known unknowns when it comes to energy. We know already that volatility is a big deal. None of us, in all my interaction with 500 of Yaza energy experts, no one could predict the shale gas revolution. None of them. It took us by surprise. None of us predicted oil getting to 147 by 2008. None of us. Of course, after 2008, I was in forums around the world saying, oil will never go below 100 again. It will never, never go below 90. Of course, I'm sitting in Vienna, and I have all the experts on oil and gas and so on. Guess what? This year, it went to 50. What am I saying? Even we, the scientists, the analysts, there's some humility here. Perhaps one of the challenges, how do we begin to look at this volatility and the unknowns? We know there will be volatility, but to what extent? Because it affects public policy, and it affects the, the investment decisions, especially when we want long-term transformative change. The second one that I have learned in energy, Bill Gates called it energy miracles. If we want to provide energy for the growing population, 9 billion by 2050, and the increase in demand for energy services we project, he says we don't have the, all the technologies right now. We need more energy miracles, he calls them. For the scientific community, when it comes to energy, I think the next challenge, how do we identify those disruptive technologies that will really change the game? One of them being storage. And here we're just putting together now a solar storage coalition. We want to combine the R&D from private sector and public sector to drive down the cost of solar and storage to change the business model for, for the utilities for good. So anywhere, anybody, whether in Vienna or in Africa, you can put up your own solar panel, store it, what we call democratizing energy. So we're putting a coalition together. We're trying to put some G8 countries together, UK, France, and others. But you back them up with Tesla, Vesla, um, Tata, uh, Vesta, and others. Combining their R&D to really make this disruption happen because we see the trends already. Battery costs go down every five years significantly. Solar dropped by about 70% in the last five years. We believe that can be accelerated within a decade. So we're working again with another scientist, Sir David King. We're trying to put a paper in front of G7, and of course, we hope we can take it to, to COP. In closing, I started with energy access. If you take the African context, today we have 620 million Africans without access to electricity. We're about a billion now. We're going to be a billion point four by 2030. By 2050, we're adding another billion Africans. So what is the challenge? We have to give the 620 million now access to energy, to modern energy services, and add another billion. I was just with the Minister of Power for, for, for India in New York. He spent three good days with us looking at many of these issues in our forum. India has similar challenges. India will have, has to build an additional 53 cities with over one million people living in them. The target set by Prime Minister Modi, even if he achieves half of it, it changes India, but it helps us too, because technology will become cheaper. But he's looking at all technologies. So the point I want to make is, in closing, is that you're going to have 3 billion more people moving into the middle class in another 20, 25 years in India, in Africa, and elsewhere. Of course, they deserve a good life too. They need clean water, clean energy. They need a few sky, skyscrapers of their own, maybe a nano car or a BMW. How do we feed all of them? How do we make sure they live the same life you and I have enjoyed in Vienna? Because they deserve it too. We promise them. You democratize, you liberalize your economy, you trade more, you are entitled so, to, so, so, to some element of consumerism. We cannot say now, don't go so fast, don't consume like me after I have enjoyed 100 years of it. So for you, the young generation, you better learn to do this well. Diplomacy. The demographics are changing. Our own children, our grandchildren, deserve the same life. How do you begin a different way of doing business in diplomacy that 
lifts everybody up and spreads prosperity. Because the iron ore, the copper, the oil and gas may come from where I live. And I'm stepping down from this job now. I'm going on the ground in Sierra Leone to see if I can make it happen for six million people. So my slogan in New York last week, which has been picked up by some research centers, ODI and others, is how do we convert commitments to kilowatt hours for real people? That's our challenge of the future. Thank you.